joint lab for future cities, um, which is a platform in, in Hong Kong focusing on sustainability and very importantly, resilience, which came to the fore during uh, COVID. Um, and, uh, but, but that's not the, the purpose of this platform. It's responsible construction uh, and so on. And she has clearly all uh, the credentials, not only of a master planner, but really the uh, plumbing, uh, for lack of a better word, that goes into making a city work. Uh, and, and in the parlance of today's webinar, um, what makes a smart city tick? Um, I'm going to hand uh, the floor over to uh, Rosanna, um, who will uh, present uh, our core theme, which is action driven. Um, we will then have a, a present a short presentation by by Gustavo, uh, and um, and after that a a panel uh, discussion. But uh, before I kick off, um, there is uh, 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 there are two things um, that that come to to mind, uh, which I I wanted to some hard statistics and facts that we should all uh, recognize. Uh, two thirds of mankind inhabit cities and cities and the built environment. And I'm just talking about the built environment accounts for a third of greenhouse gases. Typically, you see the a range of 33 to 35% from the built environment. But if you start to add waste uh, and so on, we're getting to the 50% level. So cities are powerhouses of the economy, but on the other hand, they are also um, the source of greenhouse gas emission. And, and really the quest for net zero is not complete um, without a comprehensive ESG strategy in a city. The two uh, main pollutant, pollutants uh, in cities are fine particle pollution um, uh, and, and uh, nitrogen uh, NO2. So uh, these are the, uh, the main um, uh, um, uh, 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 things that we have to deal with, and the culprits are found in power consumption, uh, in buildings, in construction, and also transportation. Um, and I, I just want to add that I've been grappling with the definition of ESG uh, in terms of real, uh, real world implementation. And I think that in a smart city today, you'll find that the common thread is, uh, is, is found in, in this uh, definition. So Singapore um, envisions to, um, to drive its smart city ambitions um, through this vision statement. In fact, this vision, and, and I've actually copied what the government has uh, declared in its smart uh, uh, nation program. Uh, it's transforming Singapore through technology. So the vision is a digital first Singapore where there are three core areas, uh, digital government, um, digital economy, and digital uh, society uh, with a view to harnessing technology, digitalization in health, in transport, urban living, government and, and businesses. Um, it's a very much tech driven. Um, at the same time, uh, Hong Kong has unveiled its own uh, program. Um, I think in the next slide, you, uh, Barbara, you will have, uh, um, uh, I don't know, well, I don't see the, the next slide, but uh, in, any, in any case, Hong Kong envisions um, to improve its uh, quality of living. And uh, I'm going to read out the government statement from Hong Kong, what, what defines their vision of a smart city. I think it's rather important to articulate um, this. Uh, the first point is to make people happier, healthier, smarter, and more prosperous, and the city greener, cleaner, more livable, sustainable, resilient, and competitive. 
to enable business to capitalize on Hong Kong's renowned business friendly environment to foster innovation and transform the city into a living laboratory and test bed for development. I, I like that approach to provide better care for the elderly and youth and foster a stronger sense of community to make the business people and government more digitally enabled and tech savvy. And I like this final one to consume fewer resources and make Hong Kong more environmentally friendly while maintaining its vibrancy, efficiency and livability. And the vision is to embrace innovation and technology to build a world famed smart Hong Kong characterized by a strong economy and high quality of living. So with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to uh, Rosanna. Rosanna, the, the floor, digital space is yours. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your kind uh, invitation. Not only yourself, but also I'd like to thank Swiss Asian Chamber of Commerce. Allow me to be here, not to mention learn from all of you, as well as sharing our experiences with you. I, I absolutely uh, feel privileged to have a chance and to meet all of you virtually. By the way, all of you are welcome to come to Hong Kong. We are actually promoting Hong Kong right now, our Hong Kong government. We call it Hello Hong Kong. Uh, yesterday, we celebrating the very first day with masks off, so we don't have to wear masks anymore. So it's easier for us to communicate and express our feelings and also our contacts, really. So in that regard, uh, I welcome you to Hong Kong. Um, Today, uh, thanks, um, the Chamber's give us, given us a chance to talk about not only uh, charter city, smart city, but also in terms of the driver, put it into actionable items. In are we, we lost? About what we've been doing and see whether uh, we are in, in tune. Can you hear us? Hello, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Can you hear you? Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, by the way, if you can't hear us anytime, just let us know. So today's I very much like to share with you uh, of our group, the latest development. Um, by the way, uh, allow me to introduce uh, my group. Basically, Yao Li started by my father in 1958. We weren't publicly listed in 1991. So we have to follow all the uh, rules and all the books and what have you, we have to do it anyway. And from one construction company, we transform ourselves into what we call a green integrated corporation. Now we have over 80 odd uh, companies uh, within our group. So from as a developer to a contractor, uh, modular manufacturer, service provider, those are all our business domain. And in particular, the last, I would say um, six or seven years ago, I started my own venture fund, which Sang's been uh, sharing that with you. It's called Obila Ventures. And we're actually stationed in Science Park. And Science Park is basically uh, also our government funded uh, location. It's all doing innovation and technology. We have over 13,000 people, over 900 all startup company based in Science Park uh, with the Golden Egg. It's also built by my company as well. And we moved in there to start our venture. We concentrated in um, smart city technologies. We focus in, into four pillars, transformation, environmental care, and all these are what we call our heart and soul core technology to enhance our businesses and enhance our vision to build or blend into a smart city. And besides that, we also have, I'm also sitting on the board of Cyberport, Again, Cyberport is the other location funded by our Hong Kong government is doing a lot of R&Ds. And we have over, for instance, um, 600 startups doing FinTech in Hong Kong. 400 of them is actually based in Cyberport. And we're also building an other extension on what we call Phase 5. So what we're trying to do is really welcome all of you from Europe, in Asia, to Hong Kong, not only to help us to invest, or we can invest onto you from a government's perspective, or from a personal perspective, as well as a company. I welcome you all. Now, in terms of S uh, ESG, 
We've been doing that for a while. But when we say, um, are, are we forced to do it? Of course we are, because being a listed company, we have to follow our stock exchange rules. Oh so I summarize that. Hello? 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 Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, can hear you. Yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. And this is the, I summarize the highlight of what we, we have to do as a public listed company in Hong Kong. We have to follow the reporting guideline that our stock exchange uh, asks us to do. So basically from our group, you can see we compile, not only we fulfill and compile all the standards, we also achieve all 100% KPIs except one uh, item, which is the product responsibility, and that 40% of them are not compiled applicable to our businesses. And that's the reason why we are not fulfilling 100%. Other than that, we do it all. But when we ask, is that really worth doing it? Then the answer uh, I'm gonna share with you throughout this whole presentation. Now for us, I primarily are uh, a contractor by train, uh, engineer by blood, and our DNA from my father to our family, I'm the second generation help run this family business. We have one thing in common is, is innovation and technology and also sustainability. Everything we're trying to do as a corporation, we want to look into the fine details to make it sustainable. Now that is very easy to say, but it's really hard to do. Now this picture here, I captured the latest project that we finished. So it's all proven but we have one common goal. It's, it's what we're trying to achieve here is the common good that we want to do and build for our society. Now on the left-hand side, that is actually the longest steel bridge that we built for our Hong Kong citizen to enjoy in this neighborhood, which you can see is about 145 meters steel structure. Again, we don't have to use a column. We use what we call a lowering method to build this bridge. It only took us one night we completed the whole thing. Obviously, we have like months and months of preparation to actually fabricate it in a modular manner and then use the latest technology to make sure that we actually fulfill the tolerance and so on and so forth with the submission. Now, not only this bridge is amazing, it's the longest uh, footbridge in Hong Kong, but also with this particular project, we had to do five other bridges too. And those are concrete bridges as well as steel bridges. Now, th that is very important because for us, building a residential, doesn't matter if it's private or public or semi-public, those are actually providing a space for a Hong Kong citizen to enjoy to live. Hong Kong is very small. Land is a scarcity. Everything is very expensive here. And that's the reason why we have to utilize our space. After we build an estate, what we try to do is provide commercial, um, school, kindergarten, shopping center, as well as link bridges to enhance the connectivity. Now, the enhanced connectivity, we also look into, in from a sparse city's uh, manner, we have to look into the inclusiveness. So in other words, mother with buggy, as well as uh, armchair, disabled people, we, we look after them as well. So we try to be as green and as sustainable as possible. And the second picture here is something that we are really proud of. That's the latest library that we built. As you can see, the design is really friendly. All walks of life can actually enjoy the spatial and the staircase can act as a common exchange of, uh, of news, tons of books there and the lighting and, and so on and so forth is immaculate. And that is only a public library. Everyone can enjoy it. The grassroots people, as well as to millionaire, we all can enjoy the same space. So we are really proud of the common usage that we provide as a corporation. And on the right hand side, that is the only the number one proton hospital in Hong Kong. We finished building that for uh, the most prestigious private hospital owner of a uh, client of ours. And they are very particular because they're serving the top tiers of customers in Hong Kong and China. And we don't have a proton hospital ever in Hong Kong. We finished building that. Not only that, thirty meter deep basement to put this proton machine, as well as putting all these um, different chambers um, for the different treatment as well. Together, they actually uh, renovated another block 
for the recovery for the patient. And that's the reason why just recently we finished a linkage between these two hospitals as well. Those for us, it's not only just a project, it's very much we doing the common good for a community. That is very important to our group. Now in Hong Kong, I know we all from a different country. That's the reason why I try to share our experiences and the local data with you, besides from a macro perspective. In Hong Kong, when we look at the carbon emission uh, sort of contribution, the worst two industry is something that I'm tackling in right now, uh, all my core businesses. The number one um, sort of killer is actually building. Building environment contributed to more than 60% of carbon emission in Hong Kong. And that's the reason why uh, we're working at it. And the other um, sector is transport that contributed 90% of carbon emission. And that's the reason why for our group, not only those are our bread and butter, our core businesses, but also is something that we want to enhance. Again, I welcome all of you to join hands with us. If you have a good solution, by all means, we'd love to have global partnership and enhance not only what you do, but also of what we do as well. Just like the caption, the change we want, the change we want to make. Now, for us, from CS, uh, CSR to ESG, we've been doing that as compliance. But also, the last couple of years, we've been heavily concentrating. Uh, I personally set up a task force just to study SDGs. Because as, as we all know, SDGs got 70 goals. The 70 goals is awfully hard to grasp, to understand, not, not to mention to apply into our businesses. And because we are publicly listed, uh, uh, whatever we do, we have to look into our stakeholders, our shareholders, and all these uh, financial return as well as my own people. Um, however, we believe if we work in terms of enhancing the ESG, but once we try to approach SDGs, we realize we're more focused and we're selecting the job of what we want as well, even though we have to bid for it, it's very competitive. But then again, if we concentrate to the job that we want to do and get, we believe the outcome is actually better, funny enough. But again, that creates extra hard work, I have to say. But that is our cooperation, is our group's focus. So I'll just give you a highlight of the 70 goals that we have from SDGs. And every single one of them, we have projects. We started an initiative uh, in terms of getting that goal done. For instance, just to mention uh, one or two with you all, the number one is what we call to end poverty. And, and again, to give different forms and different work. So what we're trying to do is start by walking the talk, how do we end poverty in Hong Kong? Now, believe it or not, we have something called subdivided flat in Hong Kong, which is a, a huge social issue for Hong Kong, in particular, the front end grassroots citizen. They live in a subdivided flat, a very small unit, but they have tons of family living in it. The, the actually, the health issues is not um, that sort of uh, up to standard and it's very crowded. So what we're trying to do is build what we call traditional uh, tra transitional housing. It's basically, it's government funded. They're not, la not lavish, not, not, uh, it's just very adequate. However, they will have a decency to have a bedroom and a living room with their own private bathroom and kitchen as well. And we try to build that very, very fast. And we achieve that the most within our group. So for us, not only we're helping our community, we're really helping the poorest people in Hong Kong in that manner. So this is how we tackle SDG in our group. Give another highlight, when it comes to SDG, for instance, number nine, the build resilience and in infrastructure. Now with that, we try to cater with my venture fund. We invest heavily into AI and robotic, which I will show example in a minute. Uh, in terms of applying into smart city manner, as well as my core business construction. Now with those in in innovation items we push, uh, the majority of them, I have to say, we haven't made profit yet. But however, that really contributed to our community as well as my core businesses. And that is generated a lot of news and support. And again, I show you the outcome are rather fruitful. So the number one topic I would like to share very quickly is environment. So we try to help our government to tackle what we call a carbon neutral in Hong Kong by 2030. 
I'm going to highlight three areas and three particular projects that I actually completed. So it's actually proven technology and proven results in terms of sustainability. The first one I want to talk about is the Green Building Hotel that we achieved and built uh, over 10, a decade ago, 10 years ago. The second one I want to share with you as a developer, we finished again a residential project come a commercial. And that is the very first project that we uh, became a smart city developer. And in this particular project, we promote smart living. And that's a way how we're going to promote and then put smart living, healthier living into our design and execution. And the third project I want to talk about it is the very first project in the entire Hong Kong. We use what we call MIC technology. MIC stands for Modular Integrated Construction, meaning just like Lego blocks. Is using precast technology, but we combine it into fullest. Basically, we make it as a modular boxes, and those boxes have a structural wall included, sanitary fitting included, and um, furniture included. Everything built in my China plan, transported in Hong Kong, bunk it up. Again, faster cycle time, better quality as well. I'm going to talk about this very quickly with you all. My hotel is still is the greenest, greenest high-rise building in the world um, because those are all proven data. We completed three higher certification in terms of environmental friendly certification. We achieved uh, what we call in, the, in US LEED, uh, platinum. In Singapore, we call it green mark. We got a platinum. In Hong Kong, we call it Hong Kong Bean Plus. We achieved platinum. In China, what we call is three stars. We achieved three stars together with more than 15 awards, commercial related as well. Now with this particular project, the end result was we managed to save 58.5% of energy in comparison to the average hotel industry in Hong Kong based on our government standard. And in terms of carbon um, emission reduction, 71%. In terms of dollar sign, in the, we save 2.3, uh, sorry, 2.2 uh, million kilowatt of energy every year without fail. And that's equivalent to US dollars, which is 450,000 US dollars every year, saving just like that. And the extra hard work and technology investment we put into this project, which is only the ROI return is 25% year on year. Now, at the moment, I was saying to Sang, and welcome to come to my new hotel. We're doing our facelift. At the moment, we, we're, doing, we're putting the hotel back to a drawing board. We're doing renovation right now. We change into a different model. Model is one thing, but what we're trying to do is to put the entire project uh, from newly built, we achieved that now, now from renovation, change to a new business model. So we want to take it into a higher level. Now, before that, we, we, I'll share with you some of our high level what we're trying to do. But just by calculation, we can apply for what we call Hong Kong Beam Plus uh, renovation. We can, by calculation, we can actually apply, uh, achieve platinum as well. Now with that, at the beginning, our hotel is used rule based to get the optimization, not linked through everything, only linked through eight items together with 22 new implementation. But in 2017, 18, we managed to collect enough data, we turned the hotel into AI. And with that, we managed to achieve another 5% of energy saving. So in other words, right now, our hotel can actually save 63.5% of energy. And again, with the extra uh, more carbon emission saving as well as dollar sign as well. Those are all proven record. So what we're trying to do right now is because we want to change a different brand. Now at the moment, we can work with the Hilton Group. We're going to introduce the, this new Moto brand into our Asian Pacific. And we have this brand in US as well as, as Europe, but we don't have that in Asia Pacific as well as Great China, Greater China. That's the reason why we want to set an example and the greenest sustainable example as well to our hotel. That's the reason why we're working very closely with the Hilton Group. So what we're trying to do it here is from using our, our big cactus and what we've done and re-engineering our hotel. This is the facade look we're trying to achieve. I have to say we haven't frozen the design yet, but what we're trying to do here is our hotel at the beginning is the very first hotel in the entire Hong Kong we use 5D beam to build. 5D beam meaning not only three dimensional space, we, we put it, we also the fourth dimension is actually doing energy as well as uh, planning equipment and neighbor force optimization. The fifth dimension is actually cost control. Everything 
is BIM literate. And again, we use digital twin to get everything doing from um, design to finish, to what we call the facility manager, to actually look into the data to operate our hotel, as well as doing what we call uh, predictive measures when it comes to all my planning equipment. We have hundreds of sensors into our hotel because we have to achieve different uh, ranking or certification to actually uh, to cater for different needs. But at the moment, we try to condense and also learn by our own experiences to try to make the most effective manner. So we're going to condense about less than 100 sensors within our hotel, but we can do more than what we can do before. So this is very exciting for us. And also our government is promoting um, what we call digitalization in the entire Hong Kong. So we've been doing that for the, the past 20 years now. But what we're trying to do is consolidate what we've done and want to showcase with our community and actually walk the dog in our hotel. But because, because we, are the, we are the owner of the hotel, so we can do a lot more than other people. I, I can call the shot basically this time. So we're going to do some super apps. And we're going to have a, a small command theater within our, our operation so we can see not only our buildings, but the buildings that we've been doing from a smart city manner and also smart mobility as well. The other project I want to share with you is the residential project we've finished now. With this project, we use what we call IPD, Integrated Pro uh, Project Delivery Approach. Everything is virtual design construction before we build Everything is sorted out uh, with the clash analysis, so on and so forth, as well as the dollar signs balance in the BIM model. And then we put that information into the city information modeling so we can see our building in comparison to a neighborhood. From the solar penetration to the uh, street lighting in comparison to our wayfinding, as well as my landscape, we can put a fine balance to fine tune it because we don't need to be lavish. The more you put in, the more sort of uh, operational costs you, you need to, to pay. And my the people who buy my units have to pay for the, um, the, the tax as well, as, as well as the fees each month. So we try to achieve the fund balance here. And we believe we've done that. Also proudly together with my partner, URA, which is a local uh, semi quasi government funded bodies to turn Hong Kong older neighborhood into smarter neighborhood. And again, this location of this project is a very um, old neighborhood. We're going to turn it into a young and funky first time buyer kind of neighborhood we're trying to create. And being a smart city um, developer, so what we're trying to do is I invite my entire uh, client as well as my own group with architect, uh, consultant, so on and so forth. We managed to hold only six meetings and together with 37 working days. We managed to frozen the design and from generating the design from the BIM model to submit it to our Hong Kong government, in particular, the building department to grant the license to build. It broke my own record, only seven working days, seven, 37 working days. The reason why we could do that is all this related software and we have our own platform to integrate the software. For instance, we use different software to do our, our BIM model as well as doing a downstream manufacturing as well. Everything is beam literate together with the laser scanning at the beginning, but now we use robotic laser scanning to save our engineers time. And we use like uh, another product, the software, 5D beam project software to enhance the optimization and time and cost and put it into a, a beam viewer. So not beam literate people within our, our, our team can actually see and, and comment onto the details, we can just hold a tablet on the construction site and then make decision then and there. Information can share with my entire project team, my government included. And we have a dashboard so that people can see everything in real time manner. And that are uh, actually how we build this particular residential project. Now, and again, we put what we call the digital experience, not just for our government, for my first time buyer to experience that. In Hong Kong, by law, we can pre-sell our, our unit so you can actually get your uh, cash back quickly as well. I thank my government for that. So everything you've done for all this submission, we follow by the 
uh, procedures and policy in Hong Kong. So we pre-sell our unit, but this, but this time we're different. We, we give our, our potential buyers a different feelings before we actually accommodate and show them the show flat, physically show flat, flat, but also we provide them. Once they agree to put a deposit down to buy the unit, they will receive a free beam field, just like what you've seen here. They can feel the unit that they're gonna purchase they can have the two dimensional me measurement, three dimensional measurements. Everything is all the information that they need, they have it. And those are proven uh, details as well. And then they can start planning. They have about whatever four to six months before they our flat hand it over to the actual buyer. They can start thinking about the interior. They can think about ordering the, the uh, furniture, so on and so forth. And this is never heard of in Hong Kong. So my partner, you are so welcome that they are so thrilled to have this technology to sell, uh, help to sell, help to sell the unit. And the director from URA actually been playing this video for half an hour without leaving my showroom. So it's really um, a new experience, not just for the first time buyer, but for my partner as well within our industry. Now again, if you and this is all past tense now because we sold all the unit, and this is if you walk into my show uh, so flat right now at that time, you'll be able to see the three D model just like that in a holographic way as well as from a big screen as well as a, a, a physical model as well, yeah, with the compliance that we have to fulfill uh, that we need to do by law. But also within the showroom, you'll be able to see the two area that we try to demonstrate that other people don't have and we design for it. Is that within this particular project, it's not for five stars, sort of a very wealthy people to enjoy. It's really for the first time buyer, for uh, like a newlywed. So what we're trying to say is a smaller unit, a few million Hong Kong dollars, you get a unit. But because of that, health they're very health conscious and also they don't have time to liaise with their hobbies or their other halves or the babies and the children. So what we try to do is we have to provide a clubhouse because this is the norm that in Hong Kong, but within our, our clubhouse, the design is not lavish. It's not five star, we're putting gold metals into it, not far from it. Our clubhouse is very down to earth, but very healthy. We have two story of open space as you can see the model. So when you come back 24 seven, you can go jogging with your other half. And on the path, you can see the calorie you burn from an adult as well as a child. And also we managed to squeeze a space with a external lift. So the disabled armchair people as well as mother can enjoy these two level of outdoor space through a buggy and wheelchair. Now those are with extra cost and you need to squeeze the space to do it. However, to me personally, as a developer, I think it's worth it because that set the difference between uh, a dollar science conscious developer as well as us looking into social good, looking into the common, the, the common good that we try to provide for a large amount of our local people. That's how we think, that's how we build. Now, I'm going to shift a little bit to social. As we know, in Hong Kong, we have over 7 million people living in a very crowded space. Even though we have a lot of outdoor space, islands, swimming area, countryside to enjoy. But however, in our CBD area, it's very condensed or living in a high rise jungle. How do we tackle that? So for us, it's our responsibility to build faster, better, and also we have an aging population. In particular, in construction, we only have just over 300,000 workers, and over 45% of them at age 52 and above. In other words, it's really aging uh, workforce. So what we're trying to do is promote it by our last government, uh, Mrs. Carrie Lam, from our last chief executive. She lead Hong Kong in station way, as well as promoting all this modular construction. And because of that, um, they give us a lot of innovation ideas and items and force the government to do that, as well as big corporation. So for us, very luckily, we finished this very first project. As you can see the picture, that was the evening that we managed to install the very last modular box, which is seven, seven thousand, uh, three thousand seven hundred ten. 
26 box. And this box module actually casts into the space you've seen in there. We have invited our chief, uh, our financial secretary, Mr. Paul Chen, to come and witness the entire thing. Why, why are our FS came down to our side? Because he is so supportive, not only financially support this movement, the movement is our government's trying to support what we call industrial 4.0, as well as construction 2.0, this movement to digitalize our industry, as well as mechanicalize our industry. From a very old industry, old fashioned industry to a high tech construction industry. So he's really trying to walk the talk as well. So he's supporting the bureau and he heard about our project and he said, hang on here, you have to wait for me. I want to witness that. So I thank him for the support. So at the end, we managed to finish this project, not only on time, a lot faster. And according to our chief executive, from her words, we basically achieved 10 months faster than our original electrical approval date. And the other important thing, and then proudly I have to thank my own team for, is that we proudly say that for that particular project, as well as the other two and a half social projects that transition the housing that we've done, all together as a group, we managed to finish up to date 4,346 MIC modulars, every single one of them are just in time. Very hard to do, but we achieved that. And I will explain to you why that is important. That is the fundamental essence of lean construction, again, to a lean corporation. From the hardcore data, uh, we managed on average for the three and a half projects, uh, we managed to decrease faster uh, than 40% of construction time. We managed to reduce 60% of manpower. And we really, really proud to say 45% of construction waste are eliminated, as well as the air pollution are down to 25% and enhance our ESG. So I'm so proud of my team. I'm so thankful to, for the project, even though it's extremely difficult. But as, in, as you can see, the end result is we build five blocks, 16, 70 story high. The end user is our Hong Kong, the very hardcore firemen is their headquarter. They live in this residence that they have to train up again, very hard work to support our, our community, fight for our safety every day in Hong Kong. Those are the, uh, the residents they enjoy. And also at the same time, we build the outdoor space for the children to enjoy as well. So we managed to really achieve all that. So in other words, our end user, the firemen are very pleased. We got a, a thank you letter from them as well. So we are so touched by the whole project. And again, the other essence of how we could achieve that is because of Bini. Bini is something that we uh, designed it and built ourselves. I used two of my subsidiaries, one of my startup company, and used four months to build this platform, and then we enhance it to 6.0 right now. So what Bini does is, from two-dimensional space data to three-dimensional beam data, as well, we put the RFID chip into the modular as act as the identity card for the module with all this quality control checking, as well as all the procedures being uh, linked with blockchain, the most e important ones. And then again, with the whole real-time logistic module and the actual checking the air quality of the driver, check, checking the, we have a sensor within the driving compartment, so make sure that the wellness of the driver are increased. And then when the on-site sort of procedure, we call it a digital procedures, all built in with our platform and the information with all the data we transfer to our city information link, modeling contacts, everything is linked through what we call ISO 19650 as well. All these are double checking our tolerance, our quality through robotic laser scanning, everything in it. And probably say with this platform is one of the tough, very tough platform for my people to do. They hated it, they hated it and hated it. But at the end, we, our decision arrived because with this platform, we managed to do it just in time. We've made lots of mistakes because you wouldn't imagine all the boxes are made in a factory manner. If you, if you actually transported the modular into Hong Kong construction site, if you realize there's something wrong with the bathtub, 
by the time you want to change it, you don't have time um, to order in a new bathtub again. And, and the cost and manpower as well, it's defeated the whole purpose. So in other words, our thinking is whatever module they come out with our plant has to be immaculate. In order to do that, we have to be tough on our quality control. And that's the reason why we put Bini onto it and everything is blockchain. So we all know that it's an actual raw data nobody can manipulate and actually be video the whole thing. And you can take pictures, wordings, everything is in it. So everybody's know, by the way, I publish a paper about that as well. You're very welcome to comment uh, of what we do. Uh, I need your advice and extra hard work to enhance what we do. Those are the highlight with the Bini module from 1.0 to 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, now to 6.0 manner, because we need to actually keep track um, onto what we do. Now the dashboard you see is actually from the housing uh, authority, which is the, the largest housing developer in Hong Kong. They are funded by Hong Kong government. Those are the dashboard that we design for them in, in order for them to keep track onto our work as a contractor. So they can see the real-time monitoring, see the progress, see the logistics, see the BIM model, payment, so on and so forth. They know exactly what's, go so what's going on. That's the reason why it's very tough for us. And the 5.0 module is called Tracy, meaning it's a short form for traceability and, and safety. We combine it with a robot that you, you've seen that is created in our science park office, link it with the sensor technology to my uh, crane, together with the support, make sure that very heavy module, the heaviest module from my 10 tons to what, 33 tons, make sure when they lift it to the actual location for installation, the noise will say beep, 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 beep. All my workers have to be, uh, not to walk around in that area in order to have, to eliminate any accident, uh, preventing the accident happen. That's the preventive measures that we, we do. And all these recognition, facial recognition and AI we put into the token of my worker. Sometimes we put it on the harness, sometimes we put it on to safety nets as well as on the vest. And if they feel un unwell and sick, all they have to do is press the emergency button, we will go and rescue them. And again, we are very rather sophisticated. And if you don't have the permit to train, they're not even go near to that area. They're not allowed to build. So we stop our workers and do the wrong thing. We're doing our best. Now, the other social area we want to share with you all, I'm gonna go a bit quicker now right now because of a time frame, is what we call the demandable transitional housing. We build for the grasswood people. Now we, again, with these three and a half, these two and a half project, we achieved it within sort of 10 months. Uh, we've broken the record again. We set the example as well. Only two months for production, two months for the installation. And the rest of the time is doing submission. So again, using data like that, we try to talk to our government and say, look, we have to slimline our, our submissions because we're taking the bulk of our time. And that is not right. Builders should spend time building the project, not doing paperwork submission. So those are the hardcore raw data we can share with our government to change it slowly, bit by bit. And again, those picture on the bottom, those are the family and the low income, and they have two children. One is seven, one is actually five. The five-year-old little boy, they never live in a, a, a unit that they have a desk. But once they move into this unit, they have two rooms, one living room and one bedroom, and they have a desk. And he is so thrilled that they, he could stop, you know, standing still, have the jumping around. And the mother realized I'm the contractor. So kindly ask him to thank me. So I was so touching the eyes into me that morning, that Saturday morning, I helped them build uh, to, to move into the unit. I have tears in my eyes. Those are the memorable moments that I feel this is more than financial return. This is the social good. This is the common good that we're trying to do and provide to our community. Again, this is a similar project. We've done it well and the government have found an extra piece of land. So they give me another variation order to build another 70 old units or within a shortened time frame. So more like uh, what 400 odd family, grassroots people can have a but better environment to live. Those are the moments that we enjoy the most. Again, this particular one is the very first 
transitional housing actually uh, we found location in the Hong Kong Island to build. Now this one's very special because um, this is the very first project that we achieved what we call the green loan from our bank. Uh, we are very proud of that as well as we managed to get the green loan from what we call our CIC is a, a construction institute in Hong Kong. This supporting us to give us that because of the social good that we've done. And also at the same time, I want to share with everyone, as I mentioned to Sang not long ago, our Yaoli group is the very, group, the very first group in the entire world that we achieved and are granted by HSBC headquarters England to have this revolving uh, loan, this sustainable loan uh, in 2018. I still remember I had to be interviewed from London for an hour. I've been talking nonstop and my CFO and the teams do a, a lot of submission and I've been personally interviewed by them in order to grant us that. So it shows you how good it's been doing a lot in terms of sustainability and try to contributing to a, a better environment. And this is again, another highlight that we um, awarded to build a lot faster to do it. By the way, this is all run by the NGO as well. Now, this is something that we want to support our, our government to actually build a lot faster. Those are the hardcore uh, figures. What our government tried to do is within these five years, we have to build over 30,000, what we call um, lightweight, uh, public housing for those grassroots people to build. We only have two years to build and five years for them to enjoy. As well as our current chief executive announced that we have to build 180,000 units within this eight year. So it shows you this is the scale our industry have to tackle. So without technology and support, we won't be able to, to finish the job because we have an aging population in terms of management as well as our workers. Not to mention our government trying to be smarter as saying that out the Smart City Group in 2.0. By the way, I, I'm the vice chairman of Smart City Consortium and I chair Smart Living as well. We also wrote a blueprint for our government, the Innovative Technology Bureau to enhance the blueprint. And one of the stuff that we try to promote and help our government to do is to find pockets of location of Hong Kong to build up uh, uh, a better, smarter, healthier area. Northern Metropolis is another, another big planning from the government, try to, they allocate a location in the countryside of Hong Kong. We try to build 2.5 million uh, residents as well as opening 650,000 jobs. And the majority is our IT hub. So again, it's international. So I pledge to you all, come to Hong Kong and help us to achieve that. Not to mention, we want to build uh, land out tomorrow, which is something we want to achieve a mimic island for the next generation to, to live. And that will be contributing 70% of a public housing, so on and so forth. Again, that's welcome international investment as well as support. Now I'm gonna use the remaining of the time to talk about governance and how do we actualize that? So for us, in order to achieve what we do, we have to look into our entire supply chain. So we, we try to enhance our supply chain for more than a decade now. So this is the maker factory, my second factory in Waisal that we built uh, a while back now. And the size of our, our, our plan is about uh, just like at least 25 football ground, underground included, and then we will have one story high too. And again, it's already full house. And the capacity we can churn out is 2000 tons of concrete every day. And we have 41 production lines from prefabricated uh, a bathroom to a sink unit to our, our structural wall to a modular boxes i just mentioned mic we can do that every day non-stop monday to saturday and again the reason why we want to do it all is because we can have a better control in particular our quality now this is the highlight of the what we call industrial 4.0 manner that we try to achieve for the last couple of years not only we're we putting financial investment onto our, our own self, our group, our subsidiaries, but also the way we try to walk the talk is we localize our robotic and mechanism by our own engineers. The reason being is because other people doesn't quite understand what we do. So if I just go and buy a robotic line, that can't cater 
for our needs because we have a different way of doing buildings, different way of doing structural steel, concrete uh, and structural steel support or concrete support are totally different. When the module are made by concrete and the module made by steel are different, and therefore the way we do that is different. So we have to localize it to the way we need and again, maximize the throughput of a production line as well as to increase our productivities. And that's the reason that with concrete, as you all know, we have to capture that temperature control too. Everything's a computerized. We have all this software, we work with different stakeholders. Everything is actually scientifically controlled and manner in order to control the quality of our concrete product. And again, to maximize the time we have to do and move on the next steps. And again, this is something that I'm very proud of. This is the actual uh, autonomous concrete mix user that developed uh, the whole idea in my science park office, as well as my team in, in my plant. What we try to do is you can see the wheels. That is the mechanic, mechanical, mechanical wheel that we can walk straight and go uh, horizontal and vertical as well. And we can do it autonomously and it's electrical. So in other words, I'm not produce any carbon emission and that can transport from my concrete, from my, my batching plant to the actual production line. And again, save the uh, forklift, save the actual uh, driver as well as the time. And the thing is without fail as well. Those how we meant by increase on the productivity and decrease on the manpower. Now, the reason why we could do that is, is about my Ophelia Ventures. One of my startups is called Urban System. It's the most famous one right now. The reason being is because we spent, I would say, the past six years to develop our uh, autonomous vehicle. The vehicle you see now is my fourth generation of uh, autonomous vehicle. And basically, not only this is electrical based and it's catered for eight people within this shuttle, and in comparison, my autonomous shuttle you see right now to the conventional shuttle in Hong Kong, we managed to save 87% of carbon emission, just like that. And we also can um, work with the what we call vehicle to vehicle, a vehicle to all the internal things as well, vehicle with the entire infrastructure. In other words, B2B, B2X, B2I, we resolve all that. And again, we try to maximize the return by leveraging our, our technology, we have to give out the balance. Some of our sensors or LIDAR might not be the most immaculate one, because if you do to the top notch one, sometimes it's very expensive. We try to build a fine balance. Oh, by the way, that's the golden age. That is, um, we build that as a construction company as well as my office is actually there. Again, I welcome you to visit me. Thanks into my science park office. I welcome you all. And those are the video that we actually took place within the past, so a couple of years we had to do different testing, commissioning under the transportation department before they can grant us the permits to run the vehicle. Even though my vehicle is level five, meaning I don't need the driver and I don't even have a driving wheel. However, by policy in Hong Kong right now, I still need to put a driver there as well as he has to control the emergency button. If there's anything remotely happen, his, he or her responsibility is to stop the vehicle. And also we're testing everything by, you know, other vehicles buddy into our vehicle, you know, with other testing uh, with the people uh, as well as mimicking the paths and so on and so forth. Cyclists, we've done all that. It is pretty safe, I have to say. And it is fun to do things like that, but I have to say from a startup perspective, and again, we make the enhancement proposal to our government because it's rather ridiculous to a sense that is from a financial burden is rather impossible as well as the time frame. Now, in order to leverage our technology, we have three robotic lines. One is internal robotic, one is external robotic, one is heavy duty. Again, we apply it into the industry that we know best which is the built environment. Now, the robot you've seen right now is what we call the Moby Inspect. We designed this robot for our water department, our government. These are actually the plant room for the uh, water plant room in Hong Kong. But the government saying to us, look, it's a Rosanna, we have so many plants, we, want, we don't want to waste time, and they're rather remote. Can you make a robot for us to go and, and testing and commissioning those plant equipment? I said, well, we do our best. 
So we leverage our robot and our autonomous solution technology. And you can see we, we actually designed this particular for inspection. And then we can also laser scanning, doing the solar uh, testing as well as all the needs we compile with their what they want. And then we develop this robot for them to actually use. And then after that, we try to commercialize this. This is how we work as a startup company. <coughs> um, Oh, sorry, John. Now, this is the heavy duty, those are the internal external robots, and these are the heavy duty robots supposed to move. Um, what we've done is we use robot to spray paint the facade, we use robot to check uh, uh, the water testing, and again, with the COVID 19, sadly, uh, we only use 21, 28 days to uh, fine tune our external robot to help our government to check on the water piping and see whether we have a COVID-19, um, the viruses in them as well. It only took us 28 days in order to, to do that. And because we have three different strong teams to work together, as well as uh, we try to promote uh, robotic onto our construction site. What we've done is onto our, some of our pilot project in the construction site, <laughs> A welding robot instead of using human welding we use a robot to do the welding on construction site we managed to achieve that and the quality are really incredible and the productivity is 437 percent increment as well as the drill bot we use a robot to drill onto the plasma cutting again over nearly 190 percent of the productivity and the quality are immaculate those are the stuff that we've been doing and these i have to say we have funding uh, from our government, which is an encouragement for us to do. And as Sam mentioned earlier, I set up, I have a foundation called Proceed Philosophy Foundation. Uh, it's by my own, my own saving, I have to say. And I uh, set up two labs. One is the Royal College of Art, which is my mother college. Um, uh, the picture there, the Dean of Architecture, Adrian, we have the same philosophy. So I set up a Future City lab there to study the spatial in terms of the English way of building it, in particular London, how we build housing in London, and then we use AI to look into the spatial as well as study intergenerational living, how, how do we do that collectively. Whereas I also set up a future city lab in our Hong Kong U, and under three departments, the civil engineering, triple E, as well as my geography department, two faculty. So what we're trying to do again, to study future city, but our edge is looking to climate change, the resiliency and the uh, coastal rising and so on and so forth, and also health. Those are the focusing area. Again, we, at the moment, we're trying to blend in the two uh, research study now. So we want to do some collaboration as well. The result, we want to share that globally to speed up the social movement globally. So what we're trying to do here is using all our collective data to put it into AI to, again, to have a better usage for people globally as well in Switzerland, in Asian country too. We're very happy to share. And again, I'm very happy to open up, to invest into us so we can help flourish the whole thing earlier. So my takeaway and also the closing of my sharing today or to, this morning to you is, there's a Chinese saying in philosophy because In particular, Leo Confucianism, we're promoting one thing it's called unity of nature and humanity. So I personally believe in that. I believe if we do this unity with nature and humanity in a good manner and achieve the maximum output for the majority of people, that will be the ultimate goal for us. So in other words, I suss out it uh, as my personal goal is to achieve the social good for the project that we do, my venture firm, as well as pushing this into my corporation, Yao Li. Because what we're trying to do here is to promote all the goodness and to the majority of people from our, neighbor to, from our neighborhood to our cities, to our partners, to our country, as well as the globe. That is the vision we help build in a better way and also not just ourselves, to collaborate to, um, freely with everyone. We listen to other people, we cater and customize and localize for other people, usage as well. And I welcome you, your advice, your investment, as well as collaboration. And I believe if we, if we could do this right, properly, 
Even though as a public listed perspective, I believe the outcome for the shareholders and our stakeholder will be profitable. Again, ultimately, the greater goods for our community will be better. And that is the sharing that I have uh, this morning and this afternoon for all of us. And again, the stuff that we do personally, it's not for myself, it's really for the next few generations, my son, my grandson, my grandchildren to enjoy. That, that's how I see it, that's how I believe it. Thank you very much, everyone, thank you. Thank you, Rosanna, for that highly valuable um, insight. Um, and and uh, we, we really lack examples, um, real life examples in ESG. Um, I'm going to turn on to um, uh, our next speaker. Uh, we we um, will have a very short presentation by uh, Gustavo. Actually, he will explain um, what exactly um, the technology that's uh, available today is going, uh, what is going to happen um, in terms of uh, directing uh, the applications towards smart city. Uh, by way of introduction, Gustavo is the founder of Stratosphere. Um, he, his background is mechanical uh, engineering, but he has a master's degree in structural engineering from Oporto University and a PhD in polymer uh, science. He also lectures as well um, and has been uh, a researcher, internationally renowned researcher in, in aerospace and the applications of uh, structures, materials, and systems development. Uh, he is going to provide a, a very quick um, overview on, if you like, the core of um, Stratosphere. Uh, but very importantly, as you saw in Rosanna's presentation earlier, uh, data is key. And um, I'm not going to explain that better than um, someone who really deals with data all the time. Over to you, um, Gustavo. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sang, uh, for your kind words. Uh, thank you very much also to the, to, the, um, to the Chamber for this invitation to be here and to present a little bit of our, our work. And also, uh, uh, also thanks to 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 Barbara for for this uh, amazing amazing presentation. So, so having a, a little overview uh, about what uh, are the main technologies that are coming from the technology technological scene here across the world, really, but more between Europe and and the United States, which are the ones that I know better. Um, we are uh, critic. Uh, stratosphere is closely focused on uh, uh, an overview of uh, of systems and implementing systems that we call cyber physical systems. Okay, so this is really not uh, a old term. It's something that has come from the last ten years or so, but in fact, is a very is a very good definition. Of, uh, of what type of systems we are implementing and in fact, uh, how they are going towards the future. So typically what when we speak about cyber physical, we are talking about the blend of sensors and or actuators and all the electronics that needs to control those sensors and actuators. And on top of that, all the analytics that uh, can be implemented by IE, uh, IE tools or, or other types of control and command and control tools that will enable a system to interact with more complex systems and in the end and in the end um, to provide meaningful information to the users, to the maintainers, to everyone that has uh, an interaction with the system that we are looking at. Okay. Um, Cyber physical is also a way to look at the problems. Uh, this, come, this stems from the typical systems engineering approach that has been broadly, uh, broadly uh, across every, almost every industry, but very strongly in the aerospace where, where we act strongly. 
Um, so when we complexify everything, we need to have a, a layered approach to validate everything that we implement and in the end to have a meaningful and workable uh, system that can provide the, the, the right responses that we, we, we need to do. Also, cyber-physical is thought as a system that can evolve. We can add features and take out some features without putting too much in cause, and that will be uh, an important uh, aspect when we are scaling up to a city size or to a very big, big building size or uh, even a very big fleet of aircrafts or uh, a set of assets that are under, under management. Okay, um, uh, in fact, this is still in its infancy. We are, we are one of the companies that we are implementing this uh, from the last 10 years. Um, some of the things that are in the infancy is also related with the interaction with sensors and electronics with, uh, with components and assets that will, will, will evolve a lot. Uh, and also what is in the infancy uh, most of the time uh, growing fast is all the IE and machine learning uh, infrastructure to be able to interpret and analyze the huge amount of data that mm -hmm. normally these systems can can generate. So the, the, the new markets that uh, will have a strong uh, evolution shortly will be smart cities, which is the topic of this of today event. And also space uh, in several areas. I will show some examples in a in a few in a few seconds. Uh, smart cities mainly for evaluating infrastructures. Okay, S looking at infrastructures that can be wa water infrastructure, structural infrastructure, things that need to be monitored closely for its criticality, and also a long term approach to this looking at the, the life cycle of a, of a system uh, that needs to be maintained uh, and needs to be maintained with uh, a, normally with a, a budget that should be controlled. And that will be very helpful, this type of technology it will be very helpful for this type of endeavor. OK. Uh, on, the, on the space side, um, as probably you all know on this panel, um, space is becoming more commercial, okay? Uh, traditionally, space is really an institutional business uh, relating companies with strong institutes or strong agencies. Uh, we see that this is becoming more flexible and more commercial. And there are a lot of opportunities either in upstream, meaning on the sp at the, the spacecraft level, and also on downstream, we, which will be the receptacle of a huge amount of data that can be uh, used in a huge amount of applications from agriculture to city planning to infrastructure monitoring. So there is a lot of potential in day-to-day -day commercial operations also in the, in the space. So uh, smart cities focus on, on critical assets such as telco towers, wind power, uh, big infrastructure, small infrastructure, things that we need to care and to have a close look. OK, and space um, mostly uh, focus on digital twins, on um, on uh, of satellites, most of these satellites are Earth observation, so they are very focused on the environmental applica uh, applications mainly. And uh, we are really working, for example, as I mentioned in the beginning, working uh, with uh, with MIT on small and nano satellites for this purpose. Okay, but what what we mean about digital twins in this case? I mean, we, we mean two things. First, the cycle of launch of satellites is being shorter to take advantage of the technology that we are developing in, in Earth. So we are not now doing satellites to be in space for 30 years, as, for example, we have right now some telecommunication satellites that are in space in orbit for 
25 years. So if we look backwards and we see the technology 25 years uh, uh, ago, we see that those satellites are a snapshot of the best technology that was 25 years, but it's not really at the level of our uh, technology right now. So one of the things that is very important is to launch the satellites, to make the satellites do the job and to take out the satellites in orbit, to clean the space, which is also a very big problem. Uh, so the cycle of launching and getting out um, satellites is very important. To be able to manage that in close detail, we need some kind of tools that will enable us to have a, a look on the status of the satellite, which is, as we all know, very difficult to go there and see. So the digital twin is the technology that is being put together, and we are, we, we are as a company in the for forefront of that, to be able to have a closer look on the status of the satellite when the satellite is in, in orbit, and to make management decisions on the status. For example, if the satellite needs to go down and to plan a new launch for substitute satellites, we can use this type of technology to be able to do better decisions and to be able to, to manage the, the satellite or a constellation like that. So this is really the mindset that uh, the digital twin in space are, are there. For smart cities, um, the, 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 the view here is the technology that we are talking, most of the technology was developed for aeronautics uh, application, most of them in the beginning. Uh, connected, connected with a, a view that was to diminish the cost of maintaining and the, stain, the sustainment of fleets, okay? In the United States, this is called CBM, Condition Based uh, uh, Management of the Fleet. So, uh, in fact, the maintenance of the system is more based on its condition rather on the, the specific hours of flight. So it's a combination of that. Um, and uh, most of this technology, SHM and other types of analytics were developed to focus on this type of uh, of problem more on the defense side, less on commercial applications, but commercial applications of this uh, in terms of uh, passenger transportation and freight is already undergoing. Uh, we see that in the in the in the in the in the market. So the objective was that, but that technology uh, as a good uh, as a good validation from that side and on the other side is very good to scale it to the right size for smart cities application. So, of course, we don't need probably uh, certain kinds of sensors that are very expensive because of certain conditions of flight and certification for that. We can use other type of sensorization and communication technology and hardware technology, but we can have the same results probably with a, a very good accuracy with, with, when related with the smart cities application. And in fact, we use that information to generate better logistics and better maintenance routines to be able to manage a very big city uh, with a thousand of assets that need to be attended and to be cared. Okay, so this is one of the visions that uh, smart, this type of technologies can bring to, to, to smart cities. So one quick example, okay, for example, we develop and, 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 uh, and deployed a, a, a system that is based on our technology and one of our base products that is called Prodia uh, for telco communications. This is focused on this new generation of 5G that is happening everywhere here on our side in Europe, uh, most of the of the of the companies that are on this side of telco services, they are expanding their uh, the number of their towers, in implementing 5G technology on those on those towers. Uh, I believe all we all know that the density of the towers uh, will need to increase to provide the 5G coverage uh, more thoroughly ar around the the geographies, because. Well, there is some technical issues related with the the the, 
the coverage of the 5G when compared with the, the 4G. So typically the the towers will be will be more uh, we'll need more towers to 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 be able to cover. So we can we can use very uh, normal technology for sensors that we can uh, make measures of temperatures, strains, uh, also accelerations, and sometimes uh, uh, anemometers. We can blend that with the data acquisition systems that take advantage of the infrastructures, the communication infrastructures of the towers themselves, and we can provide a lot of value to to them, providing the the status of the points of interest, predicting the status, how the the, the tower is behaving. Um, also, we can provide. Uh, uh, health management information related with vibration of the tower. We can in, we can uh, from the sensors uh, analyze the status. We can analyze cumulative damage and and predict the the max usage and the time when you need to substitute the tower. And uh, one of the things that are, is also uh, in, interesting, which which can be also uh, in, in, an interesting data business stream, is we, we can provide the, the local analysis of wind speed and direction. And if we have a very big set of towers with this type of technology embedded, you have a very detailed coverage of the winds in each point, and that data can be very important in, for certain applications, so can also be uh, business stream. So this is a, an implementation example. What we are looking is the is the dashboard of that. There is a, several layers of technology uh, around this. One is a, a very, uh, very comprehensive and complex database that retrieves the, the data and also enables the calculation of the, the metrics that are important for this. Uh, and also uh, there is a, what we call a processing center where the algorithms do their magic and do the number crunching to provide the data. So typically the operations of the things like this is uh, the system that is under management will, will get information from the towers with a period of 24, with a 24 hours, can be more, can be less, this is highly programmable. And uh, we'll provide the status of a certain set of assets every day, and uh, we'll we'll also have that information stored into a database that will enable to do other things in the future, provided that we have very accurate data that comes from the the towers and the sensors that are acquiring. Okay, so this is one view, uh, and uh, the other view that I, I was here trying to show is okay what we are doing with digital twins in space okay so things that typically uh, a digital twin needs to have two main branches one that is on the spacecraft to generate data okay um and uh, we, what we are acquiring in small satellites is uh, things that are related with payload status so the mission sensors, they will have some kind of troubleshooting and information that they can provide in BAPS. That uh, from everything that is related with uh, the AD, ADCS, which is the controller of all the satellites, also from the energy power system, uh, the satellite will have specific sensors for thermal and strain status. Uh, we also get information for inertial behavior. And uh, we have a part that is processed on space on the onboard computer. And typically to be able to get this data down, we cannot uh, have all the telemetry bringing all the data down every time because of the orbits of the, of the, of the satellite. So typically we'll have some ground stations across the orbit that will be able to, to get this uh, data down. And that data then will will appear from that ground station into a on ground system that we call the digital uh, twin processing that uh, will analyze everything, uh, focus on the status on the health status of the satellite. So health status of the satellite in this case is how the satellite 
can perform his mission, okay? Uh, at the level that was intended, really. So we can analyze every system and then we can also have some kind of reasoning about it to understand if the, the satellite is capable to do the mission that was initial thought. And this will be very, very important. So the information can be integrated in um, what we call the MPST, everything that is mission planning and scheduling. Normally in the control side, certain maneuvers of the satellite are scheduled, will take time, probably not in one orbit you can do the maneuver that you want. Even these satellites that are called LEO in the sense that are low Earth orbit, so they are between 200 kilometers to 500 kilometers in, uh, in height in terms of orbits, um, they, still, they still experience some drag of the lower levels of the of the of the atmosphere and so after a few orbits they tend to go down on the orbit and the orbit needs to be corrected so these types these is are the types of operations that are in the mission planning and mission operations uh, typically we have a what we call a flight dynamics is something that will calculate will calculate the the orbits the plan orbit and the real orbit we'll compare that data management tool all this data will be in the in the right format in the right database. Everything that is also SHM. So if the structure is behaving well and there is any problem, and also other things that are very very important is is the energy and power system working properly. This is one of the critical aspects of the satellite. If the energy and power is not working properly, probably. The satellite will die. Will die. Will die soon. And on top of that, uh, an integrated health management tool that will have a, a big picture of every health status of each component, and will give us an overview of the um, of the global health of the satellite. Meaning, practically, in terms of in practical terms, that uh, if the satellite is in good shape and can continue to do um, the mission that was intended to do, or if we have to do other types of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, operations to be able to try to solve this, uh, this, these problems. Okay, one of the global objectives of a digital twin, of course, is to have a view satellite per satellite, but of course, the global challenge here is to manage a huge amount of of, of satellites, not just one satellite. Of course, everything needs to work for one satellite to be able to work for more than that. But normally, uh, the health management will be focused on uh, on on the the management of several satellites or small constellation. Even a, a bigger constellation is is possible to to scale scale it down. So, uh, this is a very uh, when we compare with the first slide, this is one of the, the, the advanced applications of a cyber physical system, okay? Uh, and has all the characteristics of a cyber physical system. And these systems are designed to be scalable, uh, to be able to, to introduce several assets and take assets, and the system will be stable and workable, and also to adapt everything on the, on the go, for example, if we need a new algorithm to analyze it, it will not be, be be difficult to integrate a new algorithm in the overall system. So the system is open enough to include other things, but is stable enough to maintain the basis and to to be workable around a, a big amount of of years across across the even decades. So we can include new technology with, without degrading the the, the 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 work of the of the system itself okay this is true for digital twins is also true for the shm system that i i i presented uh, in the last slide for 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 tel telco uh, ap applications okay so in the brief in the brief uh this is our presentation for for today thank you thank you very much thank okay and thank you very much for all the all the everyone that is attending the 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 talk okay thank you very much
Il illuminating. Um, we we actually have uh, a uh, uh, a time overrun. Um, I don't know how much more time uh, we we actually have because um, I, I I just need to to check. I think we have uh, fifteen or ten minutes more. So I, I'm going to. Um, uh, I, I've got a few uh, questions that seem to be coming in. Um, I, I wanted to ask Rosanna, um, I was intrigued by the robotics and, and this autonomous vehicles. Um, and and you, you mentioned also that uh, you do still have manual uh, override in, in all of this. Um, how much, um, what was the biggest challenge for you um, when when I look at all these autonomous physical assets, including that concrete mover, what, what was the the biggest uh, either engineering or implementation um, challenge for you in bringing something like this onto the tarmac or the or the road, as it were? Um, well, thank you for, for, for your question, Sang. By the way, I want to congrats the last speaker, Gustav. I, I mean, it's really amazing what you do. I would like to invite you um, because we set up, we have a startup called OASA, uh, started by a few professors of ours. It's an NGO. I'm sitting on the board. And we look into space and economy in Hong Kong for a couple of years now. And we made progress. We located in, in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong University. And we mainly train students. And at the moment, we have different courses. We made a little trip set, satellite, so on and so forth. Again, welcome that. I would like to speak, uh, see whether we can find a, a time to talk. You share your information, your knowledge with our community. That would be great. I thank you thank for you. that. It's fantastic. Thank you, Rosanna. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I'm going back to your question, Zang. Uh, again, thank you for that. I would say the autonomous vehicle is one thing. I'm trying to commercialize it. Because at the moment in Hong Kong, we're not allowed to charge you. For instance, if you sit on my right, the, the autonomous vehicle, you will, you will be the participant. I cannot charge you any money at all. But hopefully we can pass electrical, then we can start charging, then we can commercialize it. But I believe that's the future. So at the moment, I'm trying to plan a fleet management from Science Park all the way to all these residential. So I'm getting that sorting, I'm sorting it out. Hopefully we can cater for the market. I think that's easier. But when it comes to robotic, I found that's very hard because whatever we do is customized for certain needs. And the customization, it, it is a lot of time and engineering and effort and testing and commissioning. And again, can, how many can you sell? Not many. And you need, after you commercialize, you, you, you develop so all the ro different robotics, uh, based on our uh, base palette and build different things on top. But when you commercialize it, you need to manufacture in a manufacturing manner. And who can customize the, the line, the production line, to make robotics like that? So at the moment, for us, it's rather expensive. It's rather uh, man-made. So that's the reason why it's very hard to commercialize robots, as far as I'm concerned. But if you leverage it, leverage our, our technology, then apply it to enhance my core businesses, and that is feasible. So this is the, this is the um, sort of formula I'm using right now. Right. Um, again, the other thing I want to share with everyone is that Hong Kong positioning is uh, basically green finance and digital asset, and also we have 18, uh, 18A and 18C is all about putting your company listed uh, in both high-tech, AI, uh, autonomous vehicle, all this without profit. So all this stuff is getting, besides being a unicorn, those are more alternatives for the innovation technology community to get funding. So this is um, something that our Hong Kong government is trying to do. And we welcome people globally to do that. And obviously all this will be more actualized in a way this, in these coming years. Thank you. Um, um, there, there we have uh, uh, participants from two countries uh, Bangladesh and and Pakistan. Uh, by the way, just but just I want to mention that I am involved in the space program uh, of Gustavo uh, because it is it is a huge program for Portugal and the EU. Uh, Portugal it has the I think th what third largest maritime um, jurisdiction in the world in terms of space and strategic importance. There's going to be a launch pad. In, in Azores, 
but I, I wanted to, to talk uh, about this uh, program with MIT in particular because um, we're going to the big picture thing. The sensors that Gustavo talks about uh, so far are physical, vibrational, they're used in structures and, and in, for materials. Uh, but with MIT, uh, the focus is also on on optics and and uh, uh, spectros uh, spectroscopy uh, as well. And therefore, looking at methane from space, spatial geoanalysis or agriculture, even within cities. I'm not sure if there's a healthcare angle. But Gustavo, um, Pakistan and and Bangladesh in particular face, and I mean, I'm moving away from smart cities, this is something of national interest I've discussed with the governments, would welcome having their own small to nano satellites, um, geostationary uh, focused, uh, also with uh, predictive analysis of uh, all the data we have from weather um, in a machine learning sense, but also process within the nano satellite itself. Tell me what your take is. Um, as I know you are working on this with MIT, uh, maybe a, a brief discuss, uh, uh, introduction on, on imagery. Okay, okay. so there, there, there is uh, two levels that we are working. So one is, uh, that is more confidential, is satellites that will be able to analyze the status of the atmosphere in their composition at several altitudes, okay? Uh, it seems that everyone knows everything about the atmosphere, which is not true. Most of the data that we use to design satellites right now was done in the 60s and the 70s, and typically people abandon that. So there is a huge um, opportunity in to work with uh, smaller satellites, uh, highly technical solutions to be able to measure the status of the atmosphere in terms of plasma status, in terms of spectro spectrometry and so on and so on. This is one of the aspects. Those satellites, if they have the, the volume enough, can also work with what we call the normal imagery of the, of the, of the, of the planet. So to be able to cover all the, all the imagery with hyper, hyper spectral cameras that will be able to uh, bring us the information at the normal level as uh, as we see it, but also also into a different levels in terms of div different spectra that will give us important information about moisture in the atmosphere, uh, about the way that the the geography is evolving and so on and so on. So this is uh, one of the things. What is good news? for, I believe, countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh is the operational burden to, op to, to manage a system like this is decreasing and decreasing and the technology for launch is also decreasing the cost. So I think at this point is even possible to have satellites looking at cities, not really countries, okay? So the, the level of cost involved will enable that very, very shortly. What is difficult right now is to find the slot for launch. <laughs> so that's the main problem. If we have the satellite now ready, we'll, to, we'll take probably nine to one year to have a slot to launch. Okay. So nothing from the backyard. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the backyard probably is difficult. And we all know that the problems that we have in Ukraine also have uh, complicated a lot because one of the launch pads that were widely used uh, was in Kazakhstan, Baikonur, and at this moment is, uh, is off limits, at least here in Europe and the United States, to use that one to launch. That means that other spaceports are also coming to, to, to be upgraded and to, to probably help to, to uh, help that effort of launching, which is, well, there is a lot of, of satellites here in the backlog for, for launching. So this is true. So what what is good about it is a, a facility or a, a small constellation of, uh, of satellites, satellites can be managed by a, by a normal country, let's say. Uh, the technology can be substituted when the, when the satellites are not performing well or when we have a, a good technology to substitute 
uh, satellites. What I, what I can say more about designs, designs of satellites right now, most of the designs of the satellite are designed for five to 10 years of operation, 10 max, okay? So that means that we are reducing a lot some of the costs uh, of design of a satellite to be, to be in space for a long, long time. So we are controlling in terms of engineering the obsolescence of the satellite itself, okay? Um, a lot of new technologies are already included in these new satellites that are being launched. Uh, systems that uh, will be able to deorbit the satellite very easily, okay, and uh, very and to clean the space, which is also a big concern right now. So to keep the the space sustainable. And uh, and uh, at this point, what I believe is uh, a, a space program focused on a small constellation is probably attainable for a smaller smaller uh, smaller uh, country just just to to close this my country portugal is doing that uh is doing that with uh, with our neighbor spain we have what we call the atlantic constellation so will be a, a constellation that will orbit around the mid of atlantic will do its orbit on a polar a polar orbit that passes more or less in the middle of the atlantic to be able to monitor that area between uh, between uh, South South America and Africa, and also that that corridor between the United States and Europe. So we'll be uh, uh, we'll be focused more on the management of all the maritime area that uh, Seng was was mentioned a few minutes ago. So so what I think is is becoming more and more feasible. Uh, the point normally of these decisions is when to start, okay? Uh, and if we have the the tech base that can be used to 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 pick up on that type of program, I believe that the countries that you mentioned probably they have already that tech base that will be the the base and the core line, and probably with the help of international partners that can put together a very interesting space program focus on small satellites of course decreasing the cost making them more manageable and looking to the future so looking more into into the future and also the management of their space and problems and problems that are recurrent like floods things like that probably that they can be very helpful in that type of uh, of situation okay. yeah thank you thank you, thank you. We, thank you. we have a, a question from uh, Mr. Zorkit, uh, he is from Mongolia. Um, uh, I I don't see him on the, the screen, but um, uh, uh, Barbara, I think. Uh, um, Mr. Zorkit, can you mute your microphone? Unmute, unmute your. Unmute, oh, sorry. Yeah, so that we can. Um, He's on the screen. screen. Yeah. Oh. Welcome. Uh, Hello, everyone. Hello, Thank Mr. Sorge. Thank uh, you for. Now we can see you. We can see you, right? Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you for Barbara for inviting me, and also CASS for inviting me for this uh, webinar. My name is Sorge Mukchav. Uh, I'm from Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar city. I'm founder and chairman of board of Global Green Earth Foundation in Mongolia. And uh, we are trying to help to reduce climate change, global warming, and also uh, desertification of Mongolia in order to reduce the sand yellow dust to, to East Asia. So we, we are actually planning to establish and plant grass called switchgrass, which you probably all know, which is the base of the biofuel, bioethanol. Also, it is uh, for reducing sandstorm and uh, uh, very good impact for the environment. In Ulaanbaatar city, as a smart city-wise, uh, what I will, what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say is 
we do have we are the second coldest capital city in the world which means we have uh, four season which is autumn winter uh, spring and summer during winter during autumn and spring cold days uh, about 70% of Ulaanbaatar city's households that is about 200,000 households live in district called Ger district Ger means a traditional Mongolian yurt which is uh, made by felt and wood and ram shaped you probably one of some of you people know it and uh, we have only resource of the heat is from the uh, burning stove. So we use a uh, coil, fossil fuel, to burn uh, in the stove to heat the gear. That means we're reducing lots of pollution, CO2 into the air and atmosphere. For smart city wise, we do have a, a, a running system of heat and water. If we can uh, bring, bring down the CO2 and uh, greenhouse gas. If we can introduce something to individual heating systems as works as a smart way, probably controlled by your uh, mobile phone or something like that, it will be a very good solution for people like us who lives in a four season in a you know, cold winters, surviving cold winters. So the way I see is our organization, we planting switchgrass, which will be a pellet for heat, which is not fossil fuel, obviously. And uh, we can reduce the CO2 into the atmosphere up to more than 50%, which means, you know, it's very good for the environment and climate change, I guess. Uh, what I would like to say is uh, we would like to develop something for the cities, especially cities like us who are in cold climate, uh, to bring into the smart city solutions. So I'm very grateful that you guys invited me and uh, I'm sure there will be someone from all of you to develop something regarding uh, fossil, uh, reduce the fossil fuel burning in the during the cold winters, mm. and uh, but there will be some solutions mm. came up from after this meeting or something like that. And thank you very much for your attention. Yep, thank you, Mr. Zorget, for for highlighting something very specific to Mongolia. And I'm glad you mentioned these sandstorms because they're not only a Mongolian uh, issue, but uh, the sand <laughs> actually affects weather patterns in in the whole region around Mongolia yeah. as well. Uh, so it, it is what you are doing uh, to contain uh, um, uh, this situation or, or to control it in Mongolia has implications uh, in bordering countries and, and actually the greater geography. So thank you very much. Um, you know, we might have some ideas and, and through uh, Barbara, we, we can be in touch. We also might like you to speak about these issues at one of our future events because we're, we're not just about um, the, the smartest cities in the world. We, we want to bring some of these technologies that are already here that we take for granted uh, into countries like like this, I believe Saad has a. We have a participant. Thank you uh, once again uh, from Pakistan, um, uh, Bangladesh. Sorry, um, who who uh, has something to to ask? Um, uh, if I'm correct, uh, Saad, um, did you mute? Okay. Your hand? So my question is actually to Rosanna. Uh, I'm very, very impressed to see how your company has um, actually um, brought the ideas into the actual scenario. So what you have done in Hong Kong, some of the ideas can be implemented in developing economies like Bangladesh. If you look at Bangladesh, uh, it is also heavily 
heavily danced. Like we are a country of 170 million plus people. The capital city, we are just like Tokyo, 225 million people almost. We live uh, in a very um, tiny space or um, the capital Dhaka. So in my country also, um, the high rising boom, the high end uh, skyscrapers, these concepts has not started yet. What do we see in Singapore or in Hong Kong? I really, really, um, I'm really impressed to see your modular design concept. You make the prefabricated infrastructure in other place and you bring it and, uh, you know, um, so that you are very efficient in completing those projects. So, um, on the other hand, uh, Bangladesh take uh, the environment sustainable projects for industrial purpose very seriously you will be happy to know bangladesh right now is the second largest textile and garments producer in the world and um, after china and we have the highest number of green factories lead certified green platinum and gold standard factories in the world in fact if you search you will see seven out of ten um, green factories for textiles are now in Bangladesh. But that green concept has not yet started big scale into the uh, real estate projects. So uh, I, I do see companies like you, um, they have a bright future for uh, developing economies like um, Bangladesh. And um, I'm sure that, um, I mean, you will get great success if you also consider to uh, bring some of those technologies to Bangladesh. So, um, I will I will also request you to look into uh, the develop, develop developing economy of Bangladesh seriously. So thank that's, you. Uh, we shall talk further offline. Sure, we we'll look okay. into that. So that's to Rosan. And for the stratosphere, um, I mean Bangladesh. The satellite. This concept is to guess to actually is actually new. We are. Um, we just uh, launched our own satellite from Thiels, France. These are big projects, $300 million projects. But I'm very impressed to see your tiny satellite concepts, what Elon Musk is building with this Starlink. Maybe, um, I mean, I'm mean, I, I, I still not fully, um, how do I say, um, fully clear what are the services these tiny satellites can bring uh, in terms of internet or weather or mapping um uh, so so perhaps perhaps um i mean uh, there is a market which uh, there is a growing market for tiny satellites what your company stratosphere is doing um also we'll also um request you to check what are the solutions for the developing economies like the southeast asian countries mm -hmm. so yes these are the two recommendations no questions actually Thank, Thank you. you for your contribution, uh, uh, Saad. Well, there, there we are. I think we uh, we can have these discussions uh, offline. Um, we actually are breaching um, our our time limit. Um, it doesn't matter because uh, it was really truly important to to listen to uh, the speakers. We've we've managed to to rope in. It was not easy. Uh, they're all very busy people, as you all are. So I also have to thank all the invitees who have also taken time off. Um, those in Asia, you know, it's uh, going to be uh, dinner time very soon um, to join our event. Um, let me also be clear that um, there are going to be follow up opportunities. This uh, session has been recorded and will be kept for a while so that notes or any of these slides if they mean something to you um, please uh, either contact um, the uh, speakers directly or if not through our uh, chamber happy to to uh, forward these to the respective uh, participants you know they they have a very wide remit uh, not only within their companies but within the network uh, Rosanna talked about Hong Kong and and the Hong Kong government um, very privileged um, I'm, I'm a keen visitor to these research centers, so I was very proud to visit Rosanna at the science um, to, to, to the facility, um, and and um, and uh, um, 
I, I again I encourage you all to to visit these uh, uh, places where new technologies will be incubated. And in Portugal, I went over to Porto uh, to visit uh, Gustavo's uh, R and D offering. Um, Porto is is actually a hotbed for a lot of these uh, scientific um, and and IT uh, uh, initiatives. Um, and again, uh, bridging these uh, gaps is, is really important. So again, thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you all participants for, for joining. Thank you to our sponsor sponsors. Um, and and uh, I wish you all a happy evening um, wherever you are and, and uh, afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon to, to all of you. Thank you, Barbara, for stringing together. Bye bye. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for thank your kind participation thank and you. excellent thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Doug.